Would you be willing to pay higher local taxes to fund medical researchers? Civic leaders go to Jackson County lawmakers this week to ask them to put a medical research tax on your November ballot. Would you vote yes? Plus, bringing the Republican National Convention to Kansas City. Some reports say we are one of the front runners for 2016. Can that really be true? Also this half hour, sexting, allegations of extortion, and the city council. And more than six years after its closing, has the city finally found a use for the old Bannister Mall? Welcome again, I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you for joining us on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City. As we've been away a while with our KCPT membership drive, it's the most important stories of the week, plus we connect the dots on a few stories we missed while we served you up some Josh Grobin, Tony Bennett, and Burt Bacharach concerts over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Helping us connect those dots, Kansas City Star development reporter Kevin Collison, Star nationally syndicated columnist Mary Sanchez, from behind the microphone at News Radio 981 KMBZ, Scott Parks, and Star reporter, blogger, and columnist Dave Helling. Now, while we were encouraging you to become a member of KCPT last week, local civic leaders were unveiling plans to put on a Jackson County ballot a 20-year half-cent sales tax to recruit top medical researchers to our area. Kansas City should be the home of a world-class institute for translational medicine. By having the community make an investment in translational and outcomes research, we will be able to recruit the best and the brightest scientists in the field from around the country to come to Kansas City. We think this is an idea whose time has come. Jackson County taxpayers are being given an opportunity, not just to levy a higher tax on themselves, but to actually make an investment in themselves. This is an opportunity not only to work for tomorrow's cures, but to improve today's care. The sales tax money would be funneled through a proposed Jackson County Institute for Translational Medicine, and the proceeds expected to be around $40 million a year would be split between Children's Mercy, St. Luke's, and UMKC. But is this the best use for county sales tax dollars right now, Dave Helling? Well, voters presumably will make that decision uh, if it goes on the ballot in November, and that remains a big if. Uh, a lot of questions still have been uh, not answered about this proposal, and there is some reluctance on the part of the county legislature to move forward with this, Nick, until some of those questions are answered. Um, uh, the, you know, the voters will have to decide whether an $800 million tax not only is fair and right and the important thing to do, but whether it fits into the hierarchy of the other needs in this community, whatever they may turn out to be, and they have to decide, or if it goes on the ballot, whether the sales tax is the best way to do it because the sales tax is very high in this area, it is regressive, uh, there will be criticism of this tax as hurting the poor to help, in essence, relatively wealthy researchers. A lot of questions have to be answered before the voters make up their minds, it seems to me. It also is interesting that this is going to be a county tax for something like medical research. It would seem to me that this would be a metropolitan-wide issue, not something that would be decided at a much more local level, Kevin Collison. Well, there has been an effort to create a more metropolitan approach to life science research. There was a lot of conversation a few years ago about uh, Stowers combining with St. Luke's, combining with KU to, be, to provide this kind of uh, cutting edge research. That effort seemed to have not gelled over the past couple of years. And so you saw Kansas kind of do its own thing with its own special sales tax in Johnson County to help encourage bioscience research. Now you've got Jackson County, which I agree, it seems like a rather limited platform for such an ambitious effort. And again, as Dave mentioned, uh, I think one study showed that if this was to be approved, the sales tax in Kansas City south of the river would go up to like eight and three quarters cent, which is a pretty big bite on somebody's purchase power. So while I think a lot of people admire the idea of trying to improve the area's uh, ability to do cutting edge research and the hope for jobs and investment that that follows, I think these guys have a real hard sell personally to uh, to the voters of Jackson County. Mary? I do too, and that honestly is a little bit of my fear of it, because I do think in some ways it's a good idea 
I mean, it's not crazy to be looking at the demographics of the country and trying to situate this community, this whole region, in a way to be able to take a profit off of that in terms of jobs. But I don't, it, it was almost like too big of a package too quick, I think, and to get voters, and I know that's a huge thing. It's like, when is too early? When is not enough? They just don't have enough information on it, and I think the backlash might be big. Now, you have a unique opportunity with a radio program every single day from 2 to 6, uh, Scott Parks, to gauge public appetites. What, what were listeners to your radio program saying about this when, when this was revealed last week? Well, understanding the demographics of, of our listenership, um, and it tends to be, and it's certainly not exclusive to this, uh, more anti-tax than it would be pro-tax. But I, I can speak for many of them, I think, when I say if there is to be money raised for this, at least it comes through a voter-driven sales tax. And by voter-driven, I mean they get to decide, ultimately, whether or not their taxes go up. It's not by some legislative body. But to Mary's point, and even to Dave's, time may be their biggest enemy here. You know, this is unveiled in August, hoping to get on the ballot in November, and it still has to go, as Dave mentioned, through the Jackson County Legislature, that is not a lot of time to convince people to raise their own sales taxes. Why, why then was there such a rush to put this, to try and put this on the ballot? Well, uh, uh, that's one of the unanswered questions. I do believe that there was some discussion that the less thought about this may be the better, that, that you could sort of put out this idea of, uh, transformational cures, get everybody to get on board quickly and enthusiastically about that, and then pass it before some of these questions begin to be raised in the minds of the voters. Um, and it would be a lower turnout election, so that the the you know pushing the rock up the hill would be uh, less difficult than it would be, say, in November of 2014, when a lot of people are going to the polls. Because there's nothing so big think, happening this and, November. And, and right, and the other thing, Nick, is the the idea of using this sales tax for for light rail in Kansas City appears to have died in the Kansas City metropolitan area. Jackson County appears to have, to have died for the foreseeable future. This was the replacement. Right, now, you know, you mentioned earlier, is this the right vehicle for all, for a metropolitan need? And as Dave pointed out, originally this was part of an idea that uh, County Executive Sanders was pushing for a, it was actually a heavy rail commuter system where right. they were going to have a one penny uh, sales tax. That idea also fell to develop. But, there are, you know, again, the big picture is there have been people who've thought in the past that if we really wanted to do a metropolitan sales tax increase, something for the culturals and the arts would be a far more palatable and positive approach to, uh, to that kind of a funding mechanism than a half cent solely related to uh, medical research. But is this an acknowledgement then, though, that there is, there's no appetite whatsoever for any sort of metropolitan-wide tax, that you cannot, you, know, you cannot conceivably ever get somebody at this point in time well, to do anything on a bi-state level anymore? Ooh. Even the zoo, when they were upgrading the zoo, became just a Missouri side tax election. Right. Now remember, sales taxes to some degree are by state taxes because they're paid by people yes. who come into Jackson County, not just Jackson Countyans. So you've got that. Uh, but but the legislative hurdles for by state efforts, let alone getting voters to approve it, are very, very high. Uh, that doesn't seem likely in the foreseeable future. Do, do you think that's part of it, Mary? That there's, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, never say never in my, you know, Pollyanna optimistic world. I would love <laughs> to see it occur. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, yes. though. I, I should point out also that while we say it shouldn't be a metropolitan-wide issue, Johnson County did pass a, a, on a local level a research triangle themselves, so they did vote at, at the county level on a medical research tax of their own, and that, that was supported. Mm -hmm. It was. It, it, was. It, it was, but it was not without controversy. There was criticism of the way that group spent its money, its tax money. There were some problems with the leadership. Uh, again, there will be a lot of discussion of this, Nick, before the voters well, have their say. that's one thing that is good, though, because already in those plans, they do talk about the need for transparency and how that they will affect that with an appointed board. And, you know, I mean, if that comes to pass, and that's good, because there's just so much going on within pharmaceuticals, research money that does get very clouded very quickly. The presidential election was just last year, but Kansas City area leaders are already working hard to snag the Republican National Convention in 2016. Kansas City Mayor uh, Mark Holland in Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri Mayor Sly James were in Boston this week to make the city's case to the Republican National Committee. Las Vegas is already vying for the convention, and published reports 
suggests that Kansas City and Las Vegas are the front runners. Now, Kansas City hosted the GOP convention in 1928 when Herbert Hoover was nominated. In 1976, Kemper Arena was the site for the National Republican Convention when President Gerald Ford got the nomination. But I thought Kansas City didn't have enough hotel rooms. So why is the city even considering bidding on this? <laughs> That's actually an, uh, a fascinating little speculative game right now is that perhaps if they were to achieve this, and, and again, Dave and I have a little bet that uh, I'll buy him lunch if, if, if the Republicans come here. Steady. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that this would be used then as leverage. There are some real deals percolating out there for this thousand-room convention hotel. They just aren't financially viable. But if you could say, and we had this conversation earlier, uh, we're going to get a Republican convention if we build this hotel. And I think then they would use that, they meaning the convention visitors and all the other folks who've been pushing this, as saying, hey, convention world, we could host a big event like this. The Republicans came here and use that as a sales point to try to lure more big conventions here. It's still, you know, very speculative right now, both the construction of a hotel and, I think, the city's bid. So if if we did get this, we would build it downtown oh, conventional I town? have no inside information saying that the mayor went out there with yes. a, a uh, signed agreement but, from a developer saying, yes. you know, we'll do this. But I do say they could use this as leverage in a conversation that's pretty far down the track already. But is it, isn't it hard to believe, though, that Kansas City would be one of the front runners for this, though, Scott? Well, certainly when, you know, candidates like to or parties like to use the states that they're going in to drum up a little extra attention and extra support going into into the general election. But and when Missouri now a Republican state, Kansas has for a very long time been a Republican state, it seems to me a, a bit of an odd choice. I would welcome it. I would certainly welcome it. But we have to remember also when we talk about where would all these people stay, the the convention is not isolated strictly to Kansas City, Kansas, or Kansas City, Missouri. I attended, and I know Dave was there because I saw him several times, but I attended the 2008 conventions in Denver and Minneapolis, and these are metro-wide conventions. When I was in Denver, we stayed at a hotel that was 20 miles outside of the city. In Minneapolis, we were 15 miles outside of the city. A couple of things. First of all, Collison owes me dinner if they come here, but it's not a bet. If they don't come here, I don't owe him anything oh, okay. because I don't know whether they're going to come or not. So I just wanted to make sure that was on the record. The second, the second thing to keep in mind, though, Nick, seriously, is one of the reasons Kansas City may be a front runner in this competition is that other cities which might qualify for a convention aren't interested in bidding for it for a couple of reasons. National political conventions are very disruptive to the cities that hold them. You have to close off downtown. You have to block out hotel rooms for weeks before the convention happens. Uh, it, and it's very expensive. You have to raise tens of millions of dollars privately and locally in order to defray the costs and make the parties happy. And some bigger cities, New York, Boston, Dallas, uh, aren't interested. It, it, you know, they can make more money, have a bigger impact with a series of smaller conventions. Kansas City, for whatever reason, thinks that this year would be the year. It is 40 years after 76. They're going to play on that a little bit. And for that reason, may well be in the top tier of cities contemplating now, this. Now, we event. did happen to have the mayor here last night for another show on, on crime. And he did happen to say when he was in Boston, he, he talked about the concerns of Las Vegas as another front runner city, uh, that that would be a security nightmare to to try and lock well, down that city. Yeah. So that would be a problem for Las Vegas. But Mary, uh, does Las Vegas also pose problems as a sort of sin, sin city, city in terms of the sort of values for the Republican Party? I would think it would be because let's put it this way, every blogger on earth would be there just waiting to catch the little <laughs> screenshot of a certain politician who's, you know, talked about the Christian values doing something that might seem a little mm -hmm. Uh, having, uh, just quickly, in 1988, though, the Republicans were in New Orleans. I was on Bourbon Street after that convention, and trust me, there were entertainments that you would not typically see in, say, a place mm -hmm. like yes. Kansas City yes. on but, Bourbon Street. But getting Street. back also to this other, you know, All in good fun. Vegas definitely has some handicaps because of the Sin City reputation. Yeah. But if they're looking for a place to go where they would have some clout on perhaps swinging a state's vote, Nevada would be far more... Uh, lucrative or, or uh, appealing to the Republicans. And again, as you pointed out, Missouri and Kansas, which in, I think Kansas has been Republican since Fort Leavenworth was established. But uh, 
Uh, you know, so Nevada is very much a swing state, and I've thought that maybe Ohio would be a natural place. Uh, again, these battleground okay. states. But but not having you know fifty thousand people come into this, this would be the necessity to have fifty to host fifty thousand people. Kansas City could still be a contender for that, though, Kevin. It, uh, well, I, you know, if we held a convention here in 1976 and accommodated it, obviously we've got as many hotels okay. then as just, are now. Just very as briefly, there. some of it would be held at Kansas, out at the soccer yeah. stadium. We do have uh, this, the Sprint Center, some other things. There are some advantages okay. to Kansas City. Uh, and some people would be staying at the um, the Hampton Inn in Colby, Kansas, uh, <laughs> to be able to, they'd be as far away as that to make it happen. But we that's have a room downstairs that I'd be glad to. <laughs> now, when does a public official's private actions become a public matter? This week, a Kansas City councilman makes a formal apology to his colleagues just before a TV report is aired showing sexually charged online messages and images of himself, including allegedly his genitals, to a woman who is not his wife. The Channel 41 report claims Kansas City, Missouri councilman Michael Brooks was the victim of an extortion scheme and was using city tax money to prevent the sexual images from being released. But Brooks claims the woman is the extorter and no city tax money has been misappropriated. But is an apology enough, or will Councilman Brooks be pressured now to resign? Well, he okay. has been pressured to resign. Yeah. There may be a recall effort. Uh, he has so far resisted that. Um, the Channel 41 report was quite damaging, uh, both to his personal reputation and, and him politically. Whether it is fatal or not, we may have to wait and see over the next couple of weeks. Now, what was interesting also about the story is that he said he has already made this uh, public to his church. He is a minister at the Zion Missionary Baptist Church. He has also uh, made it clear to his wife. So none of this was new to any of those individuals. So is this a private matter? No, it's not private. And I don't know <laughs> when you say it wasn't new to them. New is relative. He informed his, the congregation the night that this aired yeah. on yeah. Channel 41. Uh, he only told them because he knew he was, he was within hours of being exposed. As to whether or not he should resign, I would argue that he should, uh, because this calls into question not only character, but it certainly calls into question judgment. And when you are a city councilman and you have access to city coffers, doing things like this, sending out pictures of your naked body to a woman you've never even met, certainly puts you in line for bribery, blackmail, and extortion. And, and that is the sole reason I think he ought to resign. It's, you know, people sexed, I get it. But he is, he is a member of the government who has access to city funds or at least influence over where city funds are to be spent. Well, the, the, well and that's okay. the other important part of this yeah. story was the allegation, not just that he had done these things, but that it then related to this $15,000 for the a boxer's appearance uh, for a local private group. And the Channel 41 story got about, in my view, about 95% of the way there to sh suggest some link, but he denies it. And until that loop is completely closed, it may be that he'll be able to survive some of this. Exactly. Mary. Because that is the bottom line of why this is important or whether it's not. Unfortunately, yet another popular, you know, political figure has done something oh. outside of marriage. It's shocking. Yes. You know, don't support it personally, no. But the bottom line is the issue of that event and did it influence the event. That event had problems from the get-go. Floyd Mayweather was not a good person to bring in for that sort of event because of his own problems with domestic violence. That was shuttered down pretty quickly. The, the checks and balances that should have happened within City Hall in giving the $15,000 over Tosco Bolton and the Posse Group, which, I mean, they're a good group. I've, they've been around for decades, really. They've done some good work in town. But it was a poorly planned event. That is completely outside of whether or not Brooks had any real influence or was being pressured because of some stupid act that he did with a cell phone. But does, am I the only one that finds this a little bit fishy that the two people sure. that this woman shared the photographs with are the same two people who had been pressuring Michael Brooks for money to bring Floyd Mayweather Jr. to town for an event and all about the same time that these pictures were being sent to this woman and then shared with Ron Hunt and Osco Bolton, somehow $15,000 was expedited out of city coffers. And who used that money? Osco Bolton and Ron Hunt. And they went to Las Vegas to look for Floyd May Mayweather Jr. And then they went to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, I did a Google search, and I know Google's not the 
end all be all of, of where people go. I could find no evidence that Floyd Mayweather Jr. had ever been to Tulsa, Oklahoma. In fact, the only time he ever mentioned Oklahoma is when he tweeted out sympathies for people who were killed in the Moore, Oklahoma tornado. So why were they using city money to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma? Whom were they trying to find there? Well, but see, all those questions should have been asked way before that money was handed over. That's the thing. I mean, it was it was a screwed up so, project from so the get go. So what, completely what happens, outside what of happens Brooks. now? Well, I we'll do see. think that there will be continuing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, the reporting goes on, but second, uh, again, to close the loop, I think Scott's right. But again, 95 percent of the way there, not 100 percent mm -hmm. of the way there. No document, no no contract, no agreement, no text has yet surfaced. That may yet happen. Um, and, and then I do think there may be a recall effort in that district. We'll see. And don't forget the FBI is looking into some of this. And whether yeah, that although well, having, said, although yeah. the FBI looks into a lot of things, yeah. believe me, and, and we should point out, in fairness, that the local prosecutor and the police department so, have no. both looked into the $15,000 and for whatever reason determined that criminal charges were not to be pursued, at least to this point. That, that too could change and those investigations will go forward All as right. well. It was closed in 2007, demolished in 2009. Has Kansas City finally found a solution to an ISO formerly known as Bannister Mall? Kansas City's largest private employer, medical technology company Cerner, says it now plans a massive office park on the site of the former mall in South Kansas City. The company is planning an expansion that can employ up to 15,000 people there. So after all this time and all the dashed hope, there is finally a solution for it Bannister really Mall, appears Kevin? appears that, that Cerner is going to be the solution to the problems at Bannister Mall. Uh, these guys, I was just out yesterday morning at their uh, ribbon cutting of their new facility in Western Wyandotte County that is going to be housing 4,000 new employees here fairly soon. This is one growing uh, business locally. I wish we had a half a dozen of them here. Uh, they have the ban uh, Mr. S um, Patterson and Illig, the two top people at Cerner. Uh, this all kind of goes back to the failed deal of a couple of years ago where they were going to actually do the uh, soccer stadium for Sporting KC and an office development down there. That didn't work out. It went to Wyandotte County. But this company has such incredibly optimistic projections as far as their hiring goes. They are riding full saddle on the revolution going on in healthcare to uh, electronicize. Why, why do whatever. they need all this space, though? They've they already got a facility they, out there. They, they've they got believe, this huge one now right next to the They, uh, they think they're going to hire 1,000 people this year alone. I mean, this is a company that is just skyrocketing as far as its uh, global market. I mean, they're selling their services not just the United States, but all over the world. I mean, this is the kind of company that, again, I wish we had a lot of, but they, they They've got a loyalty. Uh, they've got a major presence right now at the Marion Lab, the old Marion Lab space on the um, on the south side of Bannister. And Mr. Illig and Mr. Patterson were buying up land during the lead up to this other effort where the stadium ended up jumping ship. They've held on to that property. They've got the confidence that their company is going to fill up this space out in Wyandotte County in much shorter time period than they thought, and they're going to need more office space. And it's it's a and again they are coming in there. And they can totally change the landscape there. As we all know, there are huge negative perceptions in this community about that Bannister property. It's just stunning whenever we write a story about this, the kind of comments that appear online. I don't know what happened down there. It was before I ever got to this town. But, but they can come in there. They can come in and, and completely change the landscape, the appearance, and also one of the nice things, uh, this came up at a city hall meeting the other day, they are pledging to drop $8 million out of the development that's put in there to help with the neighborhood, helping revitalize homes, help as uh, much as happened with the Costco project in Midtown okay. Kansas City. Is there any downside to this project? Only if it doesn't happen. I mean, honestly, <laughs> as Kevin just laid out, they're the perfect company to be able to do this. They're moving forward. They're very strong. I applaud their commitment to South Kansas City. I grew up out there. South Kansas City deserves this. And it sounds like the perfect way to help revitalize the area that unfortunately did take some horrible slams. Mm -hmm. And finally this week, the Missouri State Fair was not just making front page news in Kansas City this week. It was making national and even international news. A Missouri rodeo clown mocking the president this past weekend. Notice the broom in his backside and joking that he could be stomped by a bull. Obama's going to have to just stay there, Obama. Watch out for those bulls. President Obama. Hey, I know I'm a clown. He just run around acting like one, doesn't know he is one.
The Rodeo Association later apologized, and the state's Republican Lieutenant Governor Peter Kinder called the act disrespectful on Twitter, saying, we are better than this. The state fair has banned the clown. Many locals, though, wondering why this story took a life of its own. Did this story warrant the news coverage it actually got, Scott Parks? No, it did not. Uh, the stunt was inappropriate. Uh, to echo Peter Kinder, it was disrespectful to the office of the presidency. It was not what a lot of people in the national news media want to make it out to be. It was not racist. It was dumb. It wasn't funny. But it was not racist. Mary? I think there is a certain naivete, and, and I know Scott gets this, that sometimes when you push too far on issues with Barack Obama, that it does hedge into lands that are, that they're biased and prejudiced. Racism is kind of a completely separate animal. Most people don't know the difference. But there, there is some grains of that here. But personally, I was not nearly as outraged as most people are, just because We've always made fun of presidents, all administrations, Democrat, Republican. It was a ridiculous stunt. People there should have known better, the people that were in charge, to stop it or not, because to have that sensitivity. But they shouldn't be making fun of any president in a state fair situation like that. But I thought that the outrage and the coverage was just ridiculous. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from the Kansas City Star, Dave Helling and Mary Sanchez, Star Development reporter Kevin Collison, and he is 50% of Dana and Parks, weekday <laughs> afternoons from 2 to 6. Scott Parks, <laughs> I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.